Welcome to episode 12 of DJ Center Stage TV. My name is Jim Collins. If you're enjoying the content of our show, be sure to subscribe now on YouTube and Mixcloud. He's been DJing since 1984. His first pro job was in 1986, where he worked doing Latin dances in Hartford in the early 90s. He had to stop doing it because of gang activities. Sometime after, he joined the Connecticut Professional Disc Jockey Association, and he learned how to do weddings. He's traveled and shadowed DJs at parties, mitzvahs, and weddings in Chicago, Long Island, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania. His son has been DJing since the age of 12 and has been trained at, at the Scratch DJ Academy in New York City. With a limit of 30 events a year and a full-time designer for General Dynamics Company, where he's been an engineer for 27 years, welcome Kenny Q to the show. Hey, how you doing, Jim? How are you? Awesome Good. to have you here. Yes. Hey, wait, stop. First, I would like to thank uh, all those who are, are, who are watching. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope you learn a lot from this. And um, thank you. And thank you, Jim. My pleasure. So tell me a little bit about Kenny Q and who you are. A little bit about me. Just I'm going to go from the beginning, but real quickly, if I can. My parents, they're refugees from a communist country called Cuba. My parents and my older siblings left Cuba fleeing Fidel Castro. I was born very soon after, so I'm the first American born in my family. Uh, my family have a very, very extremely strong work ethic, and, and they did extremely well. We went straight to Oakdale, Connecticut. My influences musically is really everything. Our family, back in the 70s, we would watch American Bandstand, Soul Train, Hee Haw, and parts of Lawrence Welk, but we never liked Lawrence Welk. So musically, we got into everything. And we had dances right there in our living room every day. In the 80s, the reason why I got into DJing is um, I used to listen to both, a lot of hard rock and a lot of hip hop. Um, so I had my guitar for playing you know, rock music and I had my turntables and because uh, I wanted to learn how to scratch real good. And I never did get, get good, but um, that's what I wanted to do. So when the people around the neighborhood found out, I started doing parties. And there are not paid parties, you know, parties at people's in their basement or what, and stuff like that. And it wasn't until 1986 that I did my first uh, quinceanera. And that's kind of, that's kind of the beginnings. Very good. So uh, from that point forward and, and leading up to today, what has changed since then? A lot. <laughs> A lot. Sure. I'm 50 years old. <laughs> A lot has changed. I didn't really get into like the, the DJing community and doing weddings into the 90s. And in the 90s, uh, I was part of uh, the Connecticut Professional Disc Jockey Association, which wedding-wise, uh, when it came to weddings and, and the, the bar and bar mitzvahs, that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, the, the people at the uh, Connecticut Professional Disc Jockey Association, we met every month. We had meetings, and I really got to know all the other DJs. And at the time, um, these DJs were, were awesome, and they helped me with everything. And, and I did some work with uh, uh, another company, um, another DJ company in, in Connecticut, and, and they did a lot of weddings. So I did a lot of weddings with them. And I really learned a lot wedding-wise uh, from them and DJs all over the, the country because I would travel to meet these guys. I was so much into it, you know, and I would take time off and then I'd fly to here or there and I'd meet these different DJs and shadow them at weddings and different parties. What about your relationship with your son? Now, your son is also a DJ, and yeah. does he MC as well, or is he just a DJ? My son is, is an introvert, um, unless you really get to know him, because he doesn't seem like an introvert when he's with his friends. But when it comes to adults, he's very, extremely quiet and very technical and to himself. My style when it comes to DJing is I've, most of the times throughout the 90s, I had a, a DJ, and I was the MC. Um, sometimes I would DJ, but most of the times I was the MC. So I had somebody totally controlling the music and I was on a dance floor with everybody else. Um, some people say that I'm very energetic um, when I'm in that Kenny Q mode. So I'm on the dance floor a lot and I'm with everybody. And so I needed a DJ because I, I couldn't do both at the same time effectively. And um, out of the blue, when my son was 11, he said, um, you know, I want to be a DJ and, and I want turntables. You know, I was surprised, but very happy. And uh, so I gave him my technique turntables and a lot of my old hip hop records from the 80s. Um, because I think a lot of those old hip hop records, which I love, are very kid friendly. So he knows all of that stuff. All of the 80s, Medtronics, 
um, Run DMC, uh, all those groups from back then in the 80s. And um, so immediately I started calling DJs around Connecticut to try to find somebody who can train him to scratch DJ, not to regular DJ, because I thought that that would be better for a little kid to learn how to scratch and stuff. I didn't have much luck in Connecticut, but I did find the Scratch DJ Academy in uh, New York City. So, and I did weddings every Saturday. So every Sunday, I would, you know, we would go to New York, which was a long, a long ride. You know, I would drive from Glastonbury to Milford. We usually parked in Milford, not in New Haven. So we'd take the train from Milford to New York. So this was three hours each way. Right. And so he got to love New York City. And he, and he said immediately, you know, I want to live here. This is where I want to live. So for over a year, I used to take him to the Scratch DJ Academy. He was the youngest kid there. He was only 11 at the time. He used to stand on top of a, uh, this wooden box because he was too short. He couldn't reach the turntables. And so that's how he learned. And he learned uh, scratching, mixing. He mixes back at 11. He mixed as well as people that are 10 years older or 20 years older. Uh, he learned mixing and he learned Ableton live. So he learned how to um, produce in a way. He learned how to produce back then. And uh, as soon um, after that, when it came to high school, he went to the Greater Har Hartford Academy of the Arts. And the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts is a school kind of like the movie Fame, where all the students are musicians and, and artists and singers and dancers. And uh, so he was in tech theater, which I wanted him to be in tech theater, um, which was uh, a major that not a lot of people wanted at the time, only him. <laughs> so tech theater uh, involved a lot of hours, but that was stage, lighting, and sound. So he learned how to work a board for uh, sound, he learned DMX lighting, and he learned to prepare um, students for their, uh, or artists for uh, stage, because they had a lot of shows there. And after he graduated, he went straight to uh, New York, without me even knowing, he moved to New York City. And uh, as soon as he moved, I said, hey, you know, you know, what are you gonna do? You know, where are you gonna go? And oh, I'll figure it out. So I, I had him um, enroll in the, the dub spot. And he did all those courses in Dubspot, so he knows how to produce. Dubspot is a, an, an electronic music school in New York City. And uh, so he learned how to produce, and he learned how to uh, DJ with the, the best DJs in New York at the time. Uh, DJ Precision, DJ Shifty. They know Kennedy, uh, my son, his name is Kennedy. They know him pretty well. And then as, as of uh, DJing with me, so he started with me at age 12, and I had to teach him kind of to be an adult because he was a kid and he wanted to do this and then he, he was leaning with his, you know, leaning back with his foot against the wall and stuff like that. And I said, no, no, you can't do this. So he learned a lot about what we do and the etiquette as well, you know, um, while he was a little kid. Um, so he learned how to behave more like an adult because we're in front of adults and we dress well. And so he learned a lot through that. Um, so it was, it was pretty awesome because at the age of, of 12, he already knew Frank Sinatra very well and, and a lot of the, the stuff that we play that aren't necessarily pop, you know, at today. He knew a lot of yesterday's music very well, you know, and, and, and it surprises me, you know, back then he would, uh, we'd be, uh, it would be cocktail hour and I hear him singing, you know, um, I got the world on the string. And I was like, oh my goodness, he's only 12. <laughs> What was the hardest thing for him? The hardest thing was putting up with me. <laughs> that was the hardest thing. Because <laughs> I'd get on him. Uh, and, and I got all this videotape. I'd have videographers recording us two together, us arguing. <laughs> that was the hardest thing. So let's get into talking about uh, doing what you do while working a full-time engineering job. So I was working at General Dynamics, a, a department called EB, which is uh, we build nuclear submarines for the Navy. And I'm not gonna get too much into that, but that's what we do, and, and I'm a designer. And my first 15 years there, you know, it was great. I worked there, but I, after that, I had a, a much better offer. And this, this is a New London area, and I have a house in New London. I'm in New London right now. Um, but after the 15 years there, I had a much better offer at Pratt & Whitney, um, designing uh, jet engines for my department was the, the military at the time. So I moved up there and I have a place in Glastonbury. And this is, this is like the Hartford area. 
So I worked there for uh, seven years or so. Um, and then I came back here. When I worked at Pratt & Whitney, I wasn't loving the job. And I went to, uh, uh, especially at that time in the 90s and the early 2000s, I used to go to pretty much as much DJ seminars and those type of things as, as I possibly can. And I went to one in, in Pennsylvania. And I remember listening to uh, Jason uh, Jenai. I listened to him talk about um, leaving his job and going full-time into DJing. And I was like, man, I want to do it. I, I got to do it. I got to go full-time into DJing. And guess what? I'm glad I never did it. I'm glad I never did it. Interesting. Um, when, when you go full-time into DJing, you have to hustle. I don't want to hustle. <laughs> I don't want to hustle. I like what I'm doing. I'm comfortable. I recommend, and maybe someday, and maybe after I retire, I will really get more into this with other DJs. If you are working a full-time job, and if it's a good job, like my, mine's a very good job, don't quit. Do both, and you can do both easily. Um, well, not necessarily easily, but you can do both. I will retire with a pension. I have a lot of stock. Um, I, it's, it's just keep with your job and work DJing at the same time. Some other DJs who work full-time as DJs, they tell their clients, you know, these guys are part-timers and they can't do what we do. That's Weekend crap. Weekend warriors. Right, weekend warriors. And that's a lot of crap. And the good thing about it is that I can show them because we record every wedding we do. I can show them Weekend Warrior. Well, look how this wedding was. This is packed dance floor. Give me a date. They, you know, give me a date and I'll show you how that wedding was. So um, that's a bunch of crap. I highly recommend full, um, DJs who are working a full-time job, especially if that's a good job, keep that job especially with the way things are now and there's so many djs out there and there's so much competition and a lot of people have no clue especially if they have uh multi djs working with them a lot of people have no clue of the the stress the only dj that i know that i know and there's a lot that i don't know the only dj that i know who has multi DJ, djs with him who seem very happy is mike walter yes um, most other people <laughs> <laughs> they may seem happy you know, when they're in front of you, but I don't think so. So tell me a little bit about, if you would, uh, just how you plan a wedding. I'd love to hear about it. I learned a lot from a lot of DJs. And, and um, so basically over the years, especially back in the 90s, because 90s things were different back in the 90s. DJs were very friendly and very open. And so I, I've been to uh, many offices for many uh, DJ companies and, and we shared a lot of information. But basically what I did is I learned a lot from them and then changed things to make it my way because everybody's different, of course. So the way I plan is, um, I'll tell you first the way I don't plan. I, I don't use, um, a lot of DJs use like DJ intelligence and, and things like that, which is online and very common with DJs. And I work for another DJ company and I would show up at, a, um, uh, at whatever the venue is and I'd have my sheet that they gave me you know, and everything was on this one sheet and, and it was very generic and very basic, you know, I and mean, then you'd have to scratch things off and whatever. I've, I'm not that way. My planning is extremely detailed and color coded and it takes hours uh, to put together. Um, so when I'm with uh, my clients, we have several meetings. So it's never one meeting. We have several. I like, I'm a person that's very personable. And by the time I, we're at the weddings, they have seen me many times. Basically, what I do is I give them an agenda from a wedding that I've already done. First, um, talking with them, having an idea of what they want, if it's a ceremony as well, how many, um, how big is the bridal party, have an idea. And after I have that idea, I'll find another agenda because I have so many um, from a, another wedding couple. And I'll change the names a little bit because um, you know, it's somebody else's private information. And then I'll send it to them. And then they edit that. And after they edit that, we have a meeting. Hmm. And, and we go over. And while, and while we go over everything, I'm changing everything at the same time and suggesting different things. And the thing about suggesting different things is that um, over the past four or five years or so, we've recorded everything on video and we have lots of photos. So at the same time, while we're talking about such and such, I am showing them different options uh, through video or photos. And I'm saying, this looks like this, this looks like that. If it's a specific venue and we've worked there before, I'll show them the venue. And look, 
this is how this person had it, and this is how you can do this. I highly recommend recording yourself because when you're looking back at your footage or if you're editing your footage, you can see your mistakes and you can learn from it and you can change things because of what you have on video. When I first started my company, I was searching for different ways of doing things. So I'd go on YouTube and I'd look at some other examples, but I couldn't find exactly what I wanted. It would be bad examples. So that's why I created Showcasing Your Talents as a master of ceremonies on yeah. Facebook. And that was, a, I felt, a good resource where people could share great ideas and, and you know, learn from others. You know, you could gain a lot of insight from looking back at your performance. Talking about the planning, you show your clients some examples and, and then what do you do from there? After the agenda is done and everything looks nice and everything's color coded and everything, I send it to the facilities and I have a meeting with them, usually on a telephone. Years ago, I'd go there personally, but I don't do it as much anymore. So um, usually on a telephone, I just go over the agenda with them quickly. And I always try to let them know um, that this is going to be different than other weddings. And, um, you know, after the introductions, we have everybody dance. Every, before um, dinner, and I've been doing this for years, everybody dances. So and the facility has to know the timing for the, the food to come out. Any formalities, I like to get out of the way, you know? So yeah. father and the bride dance, mother and the groom, all of this is before dinner, you know? And get it over the way, right, right after the other. You don't have to look for anybody. Everybody's there at their attention. So we do that. So a lot of facilities aren't familiar with that. And then some of them, no, we won't do it that way. But after explaining and showing clients, it's the way that they usually want it to be. I think the communication is a, a big thing. So if you're able to communicate a timeline and your ideas, usually if they know in advance and how long you plan to do that for, and then it's, an, it's not an issue. Right. Well, sometimes the person that you're talking with is uh, the salesperson and not the person that's going to be there on the day of. Right. So when you're there early and explain it, you know, on the day of, that works too. And then they'll let the kitchen know. When you go into the venue, uh, how does that work? There's two parts of me as a person. So there's Kenny Q and there's Kenny Quintero. Uh, my name's Kenny Quintero, or if you speak Spanish, my name's Kenny Quintero. So Kenny Quintero is more of a laid back person. And Kenny Q is a super energetic, lively person. And I am Kenny Q as soon as I walk in the room before anything is set up, I'm Kenny Q. I am meeting and greeting everybody that's setting up in the room. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Kenny Quintero, my name is Kenny Q, and, I'm a, and, and this is my son so-and-so, and, and this is the helper, you know, so-and-so, you know, um, what is your name? I have a big smile, and I run right up to the person, I shake their hand, and after I, they tell me their name, I repeat their name, and I try to record that, you know, and what is your name? And then I, you know, it's, the Kenny Q thing is all uh, uh, kind of like an act, but it, it's just how I am naturally uh, when I get excited. So I, I, that's as soon as I walk in a room, always find out who the bartender is and write the bartender's name. Because later, before the introductions, I usually say something about the bartender. And, you know, so oh, really? this is so-and-so, say hi, so-and-so, everybody's saying hi, you know. <laughs> this person is going to take care of you and blah, blah, blah. So all of that is before in, in, in the venue, um, before the whole wedding starts. And, and then I get to know whoever is in charge and, and we go over the agenda and stuff like that. The, the thing about myself is, and the way I have it set up now, is um, I don't do any of the lugging equipment. Uh, those years are over, so it's my son and our helper. So while I am there, and I'm usually already dressed up, because um, in the past, we were dressed in our regular jeans or whatever, and then change afterwards. But I, I don't have to do that because I don't lug any equipment. So they're setting up the equipment while I'm meeting and greeting and everybody and seeing how everything looks around the room. Before introductions, so a lot of times they're in another room, and I meet and greet people here and there. Um, but while they're in the other, you know, after they're in the other room, they go into the facility, and everything I'm about to say is written. Everything is there, so that the, the client knows it ahead of time. All the things that I say to people before the introductions, uh, and I'm very super energetic. I'm on the dance floor. They already know by the time. The introductions because they already know that I'm, I'm super hyper and that's just the way I am. So I'm on the dance floor and, and I usually get everybody uh, psyched up and, and say a bunch of things and then I go over anything that needs to be said ahead of time. Um, so anything like um, even if they already probably already know I go over it anyway. 
you know, show of hands who did not sign the guest book. And I usually raise my hand, who did not sign the guest book. And then I say, okay, so the guest book is over here and, and this and that. Sometimes we take a picture of it ahead of time and show it on TV where it is so I can show it to them. The guest book is over here. This is very important to so-and-so. They love you very much. Please make sure you sign it before you leave. A lot of times, even the guest book during dinner, I'll walk from table to table, meet and greet everybody and have the guest book in my hand and make sure that they sign it, you know, and say whatever they have to. Um, so anything that needs to be said before I say it then. I let everybody know about if it's a garden bouquet and they're only having the bouquet toss, and sometimes they only do the go bouquet toss and they do it with all the ladies instead of just the single ladies. I let them know all of this ahead of time. I let them know about the introductions, what they're going to do. And I, I say it in a certain way. And I let everybody know, everybody know that before the introductions, we're going to have everybody standing up and around the dance floor. I like a big, happy family around the dance floor for introductions and nobody sitting down at tables. I mean, if people are not in a position where they can stand much, then we have a chair up around, you know, where the dance floor is so they can sit while everybody else is standing. Mm. Uh, so I let them know everything ahead of time. And it doesn't take too long the way I do it. Then after that, the bridal party is usually outside and I rush out there outside to where they are and I go over the whole um, introductions with them ahead of time. And I tell them, um, make sure I pronounce your names right. And I say their names and they say, yeah, yeah, or this, or they want something else said or a nickname or whatever, you know. So I do all of this. I, I used to use an iPad, um, but I went back to paper because it's so much easier to change for me. For me too. Especially when they have like the, the last minute mix matches, right? And then, you know, this person is now coming in with this person and this person is now coming in with this. So you have to draw these arrows and cross this, and cross that and put numbers next to things. One is coming in with one. Two now is coming in with what used to be four is now two. And, and so I put all those numbers in and, and basically that's how we do with the introductions. That's an, an idea of how we do introductions. So after introductions, Everybody dances. It's usually parent dances immediately after. So you get introduced, because in the East Coast, um, you get introduced and usually go straight into your first dance, which I prefer that way. Uh, so introduction, first dance, father and the bride, mother and the groom, immediately after, and we never play the whole song. Unless, unless that song tells a story, like Butterfly Kisses. You can't cut Butterfly Kisses. It has a beginning, it has a medium, and it has an end. So you have to play the whole thing. That's great. Uh, everything we go over with the clients ahead of time so they know what's going on. Um, so it's introductions. Usually it's introductions, father and bride, mother and the groom. Everybody dance. Everybody's on the dance floor. Everybody's partying. DJs, if you're watching this, if you want a picture with a dance floor that's packed, that's a guaranteed packed dance floor. Guaranteed. If you see pictures that I have and you see a packed dance floor and you see bouquets up in the air and the bridal part, the groomsmen still have their suits on, you know where that picture came from. That came from the very beginning. Once that wedding party is introduced, going leading up to dinner, how much time span of time span would go by approximately? Like a half hour? No, 45 minutes. 45 minutes. So this is 45 minutes in length before sitting down for dinner. Or right. And all of this, the facility knows ahead of time. Sure. Right? So the thing about this, and especially if you have everybody dance before dinner, is by the time they sit down and get ready for dinner, they're telling, and I hear it all the time, this is the best wedding I've ever been to. Oh, my goodness. And it's because of that. They got loose before the wedding, and they weren't going, sitting down and going, and falling asleep. You know what I mean? Yes. I'm on the dance floor, too, and I'm dancing with everybody. So I'm, I'm, on, I'm part of the party. Um, but the work is not done. During dinner, during dinner, typical DJs are eating. I don't eat during dinner. Mm. I walk from table to table, introduce myself, get to know everybody, introduce myself to everybody. Table to table, shaking hands. I shake over 100 hands every party. Shaking hands, getting to know everybody, and taking requests. So when I'm walking from table to table, I have my paper and clipboard with me in my hand, and I'm taking requests right there. I've heard you know from talking with many djs and, and seeing things that they have on on facebook oh we want to control the music and this and that and and no oh, i don't want people giving me a list of requests because that that i'm not creative that way and i understand them 
but this is how we do it. We want the list. And sometimes my son gets upset with me if I don't have a list of requests. So we have a whole list of requests and we work off of that. And my son picks and chooses between the songs and what works best um, from that list. And um, the good thing about that is by the time you're ready to dance, we know what everybody wants and everybody knows me. I'm easy to approach now. So it's not, I, to me, it's not over in the beginning. It's, it's work and it's work all the way through to the end. You have some products that you've put out. Tell me a little bit about those. So the whole DJ booth came because I was sick and tired of taking over an hour. I had a lot of stuff. We have a lot of stuff. You know, taking over an hour, a lot of times two hours, to bring in a lot of separate pieces and putting it together on tables. And I wanted an a all-in-one, uh, you know, combination just rolling right in and plug and play. And I, I seen a DJ from Kansas, which I never see this guy in any of the, of the Facebook groups or any of the DJ groups. So he's, he's not known that way. Um, but anyway, he had built the booth. He welded it together himself, the frame. You know, it's all steel, so it must be very heavy. I seen the frame, the picture of the frame online, and then I seen the, the pictures of the complete package. I said, oh my God, this is exactly what I want, you know? So I called the guy, and the guy was very friendly. And so we talked about it, and we talked about making it with CAD. I work with 3D CAD every day, so this, you know, this is something I know well. So after looking at it, and even before I built my first booth, um, it was a year of thinking about it on a regular basis and changing different designs uh, on my CAD system. And so what I did is I built a model of my trailer and everything that goes in my trailer. And I took all those models and loaded everything in the trailer a certain way. And now I knew what size that booth had to be and it couldn't be bigger than this size, okay? So my booth is 21 inches wide. Now with 21 inches, it doesn't give you a lot of room. Um, for your computer and, and your stuff at the same time. And I wanted the computers hidden. I don't want everybody to, I, I, for me, I don't like the idea of looking at DJs with three or four computers out there. And I don't like, I want all that hidden. So uh, I came out with the idea of building a slide drawer. And so the slide drawer, because my son doesn't like push buttons, he likes turntables. So the slide door would have, you know, the turntables and the mixer and everything. Uh, the top shelf would have your computers and extra accessories that you would put in. But then when I thought about the booth, I said to myself, well, I see so many DJs who bring TVs, but they bring it in separate cases. What a waste. You know, you can have your TVs right in the booth, have them slide right in the booth, your extra TVs, right? So I, the booth has a TV in front for whatever display, you know, you want to display the, the bride and groom's name or the bar and bat mitzvah or the quinceanera's name. And then inside the booth will have your extra TVs that you can take out and hang. You can put your heavy uh, moving headlights or whatever. You can put all of that in the booth. Have, make your booth your whole storage compartment that will work for whatever you need to do to DJ. So our setup, and our setup is big. Um, if you see it, it's usually big. It usually takes about 15, 20 minutes. The booth, the stages, I make my own stages. Um, I got into making my own stages, light up stages, stage, stages that light up. I made my first ones in the 90s. There was a guy in, um, in uh, Massachusetts, uh, the company was called uh, Showcase. I knew, I knew how to make it. And so I made it after that. And um, then when LEDs came out, um, and I didn't know what to do with LEDs really, so I bought, and I highly recommend it if you wanna buy, uh, buy from Bobby Morgenstein. Uh, he has his own LED stages. I bought the stages, and they weren't totally the way I wanted them. Um, so I tore it apart. I opened it up and I seen how it was made. I made my own after that and I sold his. So we make booths. I've made it for one extra DJ. I have inquiries about it almost on a daily basis. I just don't really have the time. Um, and, and the thing about my video on the booth is I said that it will be custom. I can make it your way. Uh, when I do make the booths, it will be made my way. And I'm gonna make several. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a different design. Everything would be welded and it, it would be, I'm going to make several and sell those, but I don't have the time to make individual booths for people anymore. But the visuals and the designing of them, it's brilliant.
just as that advice for uh, other DJs or yep. others that really want to get in this business and, and change the way things are and, and raise the bar, you know, and create a new standard. Um, what I recommend is um, things were different in the 90s. In the 90s, I would visit a lot of DJs and they would show me what they do. And things aren't really that way anymore, but it's, it's still okay. I recommend visiting DJs and paying them. Paying them, for, and I have done it. I've done it myself. And paying them for their advice. And um, visit these DJs and you know, get ideas and change it and make it your way. Right. And a lot of times their way isn't the best. It's not going to work for you. So change it and make it your way. Kenny, thanks for sharing your insights and just your knowledge about the industry. So I think many DJs will respond to this and be able to learn a lot from it. So what is the best way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, I'm on Facebook all the time. So <laughs> just go to Facebook, send me a message. And that's cool. Uh, majority of times I will answer right away. Uh, sometimes I don't, but majority of times I do. I recommend personal Facebook though and, and not business Facebooks for some reason. I don't always get those messages. I don't know why, but a lot of times those messages are, are late. Kenny, thanks so much for coming on the show. Stay tuned next week for episode 13. We'll see you again.